is Kimberly Higgins. This is Lisa Laundry and Jennifer DeVajan Benson. And um, this will be an unmoderated panel, so it'll be fairly flexible. Um, there'll be time for questions afterward, but I thought what we do is maybe just introduce each of ourselves for a moment and talk about some of the experiences that we've had that require courage on a daily basis um, in what we individually do. medication therapy. 
It's not a popular topic, especially in the United States. And before this, I was extremely private about my personal struggle with inflammatory bowel disease. My best friend did not know that that was my uh, medication and part of my therapy until I had issued IP, and I finally shared and opened up to her. So the big moment of bravery, I guess if you will, came when I recognized that I could sell the IP, I could make you know, a very nice uh, return on my investment, but I wasn't going to guarantee, and that would not guarantee that patients around the world would have access to the device. It's a very inexpensive uh, plastic product, and I became feeling somewhat guilty that I would have access to it, I would live a better life, and there were other people out there suffering. That happened about two and a half years ago. Uh, my ability to talk to you today comes from years of practice and telling people about my story. Some people have decided that uh, they're uncomfortable with the topic, uh, they're uncomfortable with me talking about my struggle, or the fact that I own a medical device company in the space of gastroenterology. Um, but I do it because I work every day so that other people can maintain their privacy, so that other people can live a better quality of life, so that caregivers who are, you know, caring for a loved one who's in hospice, or an, a mother um, who is caring for a child, or a woman, or a, or a son, a mother or daughter who's um, faced with caring for an older generation who's at the end of life, that they have that dignity and self of separation during the administration of suppositories. So here I am at the sort of threshold of commercialization. It will uh, be a global product, and uh, I think I, I really did dig deep to uh, you know, really step out there. And if the message that I have for you is that yes, it's great to work and focus on a business that gives you great passion, something that you really, really love. And that's what I had before with my sewing work and my sewing workroom. I thought that was it. I really did. I thought that was my life's work is what I was passionate about. And you can be a successful business owner and entrepreneur even though you may not be as passionate for the product as I am. I do like my product, but I'm not passionate for it. So that's my story of courage and entrepreneurship. Hi, I'm Lisa Landry. I founded Savvy in um, 1998. This year will be 15 years old. I started Savvy Workshop about three years ago, so I guess that makes me a serial entrepreneur like you. <laughs> Those of us who do more than one. Um, one was enough, I think. Um, I was very busy with one. I think I've been entrepreneurial my entire career. I went to school initially thinking I was going to be a graphic designer, an art director, creative director. Um, I did get a degree in, in graphic arts, but I got very interested in the technology of printing and really enjoyed the entire process. It's sort of an art and a science, and I found that I was very good at helping take a creative um, piece and make it work on press the way that the designer and the client wanted it to work, and changed up my vision of where I was going with my career. I ended up in a sales role, and um, I think being entrepreneurial just in spirit, it was a really nice way for me to sort of create my own destiny. So I was working with a lot of creative people. I was working with the production. I was staying on top of new technology and learning about what is the best, newest, fastest way to get something done. And um, I really enjoyed it quite a lot. I was working with a lot of Fortune 500 companies. I was working with very, very large printing firms out in the Midwest, many of them are. And I was flying a lot. Um, so the first several years of my career, I worked as a member of a firm and I had sort of graduated to a place where I was 100% commissioned. So I felt like a business owner. I really felt like I was, you know, if I didn't sell anything, I wouldn't make any money. If I sold, I made money, and you know, they took a portion to the firm to, to pay for overhead and such. But I didn't have a lot of risk, so that was one of the things that being part of that firm sort of protected me from. I didn't really have to do the books. I just invoiced the work that I had produced, and I told them I quoted this, and this is what we're selling it for, and this is what it cost, and you know, I kind of gave them the cost accounting, but they had to, to figure it all out and put it all to bed when the job was over. Um, everything changed in 1997 when I had my son. 
Um, I had a, a little boy, and uh, when I was pregnant for him, we'd been trying for quite some time to have a child, and I had a crazy life. I was probably working 70 hours most weeks, and I was flying a lot, and I knew I needed to slow down, and I was really excited to have this baby, and I wanted to take some time off. So I took 12 weeks off to stay home with my son when he was born, and all my friends said, you are going to be out of your mind bored, because I was a go, 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 high energy person, and they thought I was going to be sore. I was not bored. In fact, I bawled my eyes out the 12th week that I had to go back uh, to work. I just didn't know how I was going to do it again. So I tried to go back and renegotiate my situation. I asked for a support person. Um, we tried some different things for a while so that I could work um, a little less schedule. I was trying to work from home two days a week so I could be with the baby more. Um, I think about three months into going back to work, I was back at 60 hours a week. I was back on the goddamn plane. I was like, oh, <laughs> you know, um, I was trying to nurse my baby. I was very, I was committed. I was going to nurse my baby for a year. That was really what I wanted. And um, I ended up having to fly to Cincinnati to see a job run. And for any of you that's been in the printing industry, things don't always happen on a timely basis. It's something, you know, they have a bad plate, they have to go remake the plate. It could be a three hour delay on press. And these are huge web presses that have like three <coughs> staircases to get to the top of them. And they run, you know, hundreds of thousands of copies of everything. So when you have to set something up like that, it's a timely thing. I had had um, a plane ticket to come back home that would have gotten me home in the evening to see my child. So it was like a one day thing. I was going out, I was gonna approve my thing that I was getting paid to watch, and I was coming home. I missed my plane by five minutes. And I had pretty much a, a small nervous breakdown, I think, in the Cincinnati airport. I had brought my breast pump in case I didn't make it home. And when I left the printing plant, I drove like a crazy person to drop off the rental car and uh, to make that flight. And I didn't stop to use the breast pump. I hadn't pumped all day. I was in agony, but I'm like, if I get on the plane, I will get home, I'll see my baby. I missed the plane by five minutes. I went into the bathroom and I plugged in the breast pump and uh, it didn't quite reach under the stall. So it was outside the stall. And then the tubes went underneath the stall door <laughs> and I sat on the floor and I bawled my eyes out. And all of these women travelers are coming in like, are you okay, honey? I'm like, Yes, you know, but it really wasn't okay. And I came home that night and I said, I can't do it anymore. I just can't do it. Um, when I told the firm that I worked for that I was leaving, I think they were shocked because I, I was very well compensated and they took care of me. It wasn't like, you know, they respected me and I had so many good things there. They were, you know, if I did a pros and cons list today, it'd still be hard to make that decision. But it was an emotional lifestyle thing. And I knew I wasn't going to make as much money working on my own, but I started to think differently. I thought, well, how big does this have to be for me to feel like I'm in the game and I'm still, you know, in charge of my own destiny and I'm still able to chase my dream and I don't have my whole career on ice, but that I can be more flexible and have more time for my child. Um, and that took a lot of courage to make that step. Um, when I started the business, um, I didn't think it would be where it is today. I found out very quickly, like many entrepreneurs do, and many of you are entrepreneurs, I'm, I'm sure you know, I, I hear all the time, I'm going to start my own business because I want, I want to be in charge of my schedule. <laughs> well, <laughs> it only works to a certain extent. Sometimes you can decide when you're going to work, but believe me, if you're going to be successful, you're going to work, you're going to put in the time. So you might do it on Saturday afternoon, or you might do it on Friday night at 9 o'clock, so you made that soccer game, or you went to that dentist appointment with your child, but you're going to do it. You're going to have to fit it in. What I found out, starting my own business was that I had always been good in a sales role and I am creative. So I had those two things going for me, but there were a lot of other hats as a business owner that I wasn't very comfortable wearing. The very first week I had to start doing accounting and I don't have an accounting mind. I, I know I don't, but I wasn't ready to hire an accountant either. So I had to figure it out. I had to learn how to wear that hat as uncomfortable as it was. I do have a full-time bookkeeper now and a CPA and I love them both because it's not something I love to do, but I do still need to understand it. I need to understand how to read my statements. I need to understand how to manage my business. Um, hiring people and, and managing and all of those types of things, I was very much uh, like a lone wolf. I was very much, you know, an independent person and having to be responsible for other people and make sure that they're doing what they're supposed to be doing and that their schedules are set and so forth. That was a lot for me to, to handle. It took a lot of courage to make that first hire. It took a lot of courage the first time I had to fire someone. I think there's a lot of little things you do as an entrepreneur that get you out of your comfort zone on a daily basis. 
you get curveballs thrown at you that you've never had to catch before, and you're like, well, I've never done this before, but I guess I'm in the hot <laughs> seat because I'm the boss, so I'm going to have to figure it out. Um, and for all of you that, that have been there, I, I'm sure you relate. It's, you, you will maybe be really good at doing that thing that is your core business, but that thing isn't the thing you get to do all day when you're an entrepreneur. You still have to manage your business. And it takes a lot of courage to manage a business. I'll turn over to you. I love that you told me I have a wellness center on the sea coast uh, near Portsmouth, and uh, I opened it up six years ago in Cardia Center for Wellbeing. And um, within that time, it has evolved into a wellness center with a focus on women's wellness. And really, just for the reasons that we're talking about, because after opening, I got to experience what it was like to be on the other side. Um, and that's what got me. You talk about your why and your it's, we all have so much to give, but if we're so depleted and worn down and, you know, just can't get up in the morning, it's really hard to show up with your passion in this world. Um, and so that's, that's what I did. Um, I didn't ever plan to, well, well, I knew I was going to be an entrepreneur in some sense just because I'm not very good at working for someone. Um, I, I didn't know that I was going to be working with people. Uh, and that was sort of a shocker in the end. To be a doctor, you, you're going to work with people. Um, but I'm sort of a nerd, and I started my, um, my education in genetic engineering. And so I was probably going to work in a lab somewhere, and I was really enchanted with the idea of the small, like the tiny thing that can make a difference in the overall big picture. And that's what genetics meant to me, you know. And so I, I was all going to go to study. And um, I, I got to school, and I got really sick. My first um, couple of semesters, I ended up going home for Christmas and like searing pain in my abdomen. And what happened was that my appendix had burst. And um, for not for reasons that I understood at the time, but looking back, I can certainly see all the things that had led up to that. But during that time in the hospital, uh, I think you know, it, it takes things to happen before we really look at things closely. It was the first time where I think I felt um, powerless, um, where I felt uncertain, um, where I felt helpless. And you know, it, it's, it was my appendix. It wasn't something chronic and with the intensity that people deal with every day, but it was really scary in the moment, and it was um, the thing that had me question health for the first time. You know, and it, all those questions you ask yourself when something happens. Why me? Like, why did this happen now? Uh, was there anything that I could have done to prevent this? What did I do wrong in any way? Did I not, you know, pretty healthy, I guess, you know, if you consider being a vegetarian and considering chocolate covered almonds your source of protein, you know. Um, but in thinking that, you know, I was in the hospital thinking, well, you know, does this just happen? Does life just happen this way? And are we kind of victims of circumstance with our health? And did we just deal with it? Really, that was that lit a fire in my belly. And you know, not this fire in the appendix, but that was the moment where I really thought, you know, that isn't good enough for me. But you, you have to listen to your instincts sometimes. And um, for me, that that feeling that no, this this isn't it. And but I've got to figure this out because this isn't good enough for me, and it certainly isn't good enough for anybody I know. Um, so I went back to school, I didn't have answers, <laughs> no answers, but I went back to school and I knew I needed to switch directions. I wasn't happy with what I was doing. and um, So I thought, well, you know, I really want to be in paleontology and like dust off bones, and that's calm and relaxing, <laughs> maybe the sun all day. Uh, and in that, I, I needed to take a whole bunch of biology and anatomy courses, and I ended up taking cadaver anatomy. And um, mm. with that process, oh my goodness, you hear about you can imagine what it would be like in, in that lab. But what I really came out of that with was an appreciation for how elegantly everything is organized and interconnected and works together and um, and it just does. You know, I saw that. And I didn't really know what to do with it, but that sort of like logged in my brain. 
that's a piece of this, whatever it is, sort of the journey that we all have. And um, I ended up, I don't know even how it happened, but, oh, well, my specialty, I'm, I'm a nervous system specialist, I am a doctor of, of chiropractic, and I, I trained eventually, my, my postgraduate was training that really talks about personal physiological resourcefulness, and, and my passion is about how we can be physiologically resourceful, but also how our, how our habits um, can affect that and impact it. Because after all, our, our bodies really are expressions of our lives. You know, we know that, right? <laughs> Inside, we, we know this. No matter how much we want to you know, grab those outside things, our bodies are expressions of our lives. Um, so I got that. I, I got that really strongly at some point. I ended up going uh, to Iowa to school and living in several states and finally making my way out to New Hampshire and working in some group practices. Uh, I practiced in Cambridge, I practiced in New Mass, and I was commuting back and forth. Um, and then I, I finally had to just, you know, you have your own, you gotta do it your own way. And so that was my, they call it your entrepreneurial seizure, your mm -hmm. entrepreneurial spasm. <laughs> it had to happen at a certain point. Mm -hmm. And um, in the beginning of 2008, I became a permanent resident, I'm a Canadian. Um, I married my husband. And I opened a business. And the uh, company that my husband was working for at the time was purchased, and so he was suddenly out of a contract. So um, by fire, entrepreneurism, <laughs> entrepreneur, entrepreneurial, by fire. Um, so I started my practice, and, uh, and you learn your technical skill, right? And somebody along the way says, read the email. And if you haven't, you really should. The entrepreneurial myth. Where you have to understand that as an entrepreneur, you're, you're not only going to be that technical person doing that technical skill that you learned, um, whatever it may be, but you're also going to be a business manager with all the roles and the accounting and the paperwork and the documentation and the, um, the marketing. But you're also the visionary. You're that, that person who's going to lead that enterprise forward. <coughs> so uh, I opened up my practice and you know, the first five people came in and thanked goodness they were my friends, right? And my husband sent an email to all of his contacts, and a couple of them came in, and that was it, you know, at the very beginning. Where I think my next step in courage was to step outside of that and to realize, yeah, you are going to have to go and talk to people <coughs> to grow your practice so, so that you can have the kind of impact that you want to have. And I attended every chamber meeting and every BNI meeting and every health fair and every road race and all of these things. I joined all kinds of groups and just put myself out there and started to build a foundation. And by the end of the first six months of my second year, we had doubled our entire first year. By the end of third year, we five times what we did in the second year. And um, it, it was pure go, 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 go. And being with the person individually, working with people, also being there present 100%, you know. So it didn't take a lot of courage to get started, but it started to take courage to get out there and make things grow. The next step where I, I had to address something was that, well, you can imagine what that does to you. You know, um, I started to get really tired and depleted, and I wasn't uh, walking my talk. <laughs> Necessarily, and patients can tell. Clients, you can tell when someone's well or not. And I would wake up in the morning and had just, if you've ever felt that so tired behind your eyes that you know if you close your eyes, you could sleep for hours, you know, and started to get breast pain and started to really eat a lot of sugar and a lot of caffeine, just kind of keep going, and um, just really kind of distance myself from the passion. And and my business started to filter away, and it started to attract people who were leading the same kind of lives. And it was very frustrating. And at some point, I, you know, I was doing a lot of business coaching, a lot of um, working with organizations to grow the business and uh, all of those things. And I was standing up in front of the room, January a year and a half ago, and got it, got to get really clear about what what it was that I, I wanted because I had the business and it was growing. It was but I wasn't, and I, I think we're going to talk a lot about that with our questions, but oh my goodness, um, this is what you have to know if you're not an entrepreneur already, you have to 
take care of yourself. It, it's crucial because it will impact everything around you. It doesn't like it from everything. You have to be first. I know you hear this, but you have to have to be first. Um, so I got that, and, and I turned everything around. I, we were working from 7 in the morning until 7 at night with a little break in the middle, and sometimes later someone couldn't make it for an appointment. Um, sometimes on you know Saturday mornings, or I would go to people's houses and tote my tables along, and it just wasn't working. So I went to half hours because I couldn't do anything else. Um, I changed my team around quite a bit. Um, oh my goodness, we made a lot of changes. I cut out a lot of insurance relationships that were requiring so much documentation and taking time away from patients. I'm almost done. <laughs> and um, it just changed everything. And that's been in the last year and a half. And um, I put the focus on my well-being again. And so now the courage is really like what we had talked about, like getting up in the morning. and taking 10 minutes to go for a walk outside. You know, making the green juice in the morning, because if I don't make it first, I'll stop and have a cookie and a mocha <laughs> at the cafe between my home and my office. You know, um, and not doing the intense exercise that you have to get at a 4.30 in the morning to get to the gym, to have the shower, to do the thing. Didn't work for me anymore. We evolve over time, you know. Taking care of myself and pulling away from the organizations I didn't have passion for, but Maybe I thought I needed to be part of my business and connecting to my community in a way that was meaningful for me. Um, I am so proud to be part of um, the board for Arts and Reach, which supports young women in developing uh, healthy self-worth and self-esteem through arts programs. You know, there are some things I feel passionate about and that I want to be involved with. I put my energy down. And um, it gives me all the difference. So those are some of the, I guess, the courageous, I guess, steps along my pathway, and, and that's where I'm at today. Um, yes? Mm -hmm. Thank you, guys. Should we, should we talk about some of the questions that we have? Sure. <coughs> the paper. Because the good thing is when you start to take care of yourself, you, you start to realize you don't have to memorize everything anymore. <laughs> Actually, I had a line of clothing, 
and I was 27 years old, and within the first seven months, the demand for the product was so great that I was overwhelmed. And do you know what my fear was? My fear was what I really wanted to do was quit. I wanted to leave. I, and I will say that my mother really did support my decision in doing that, and I did. And the men in my life did not support that decision. They said that you have this phenomenal business. People want your product. Why wouldn't you just keep working at it? And I had a child, and I wanted to be a mother, and this wasn't the business that I wanted, so I did. It was like being on the Acela train and jumping off, and that's what I did. So a year and a half later, I started the business again, and I reconstructed it to the interior design trade, and I did custom work, and it worked out beautifully, and that's how I built my first business. I was all alone, though. Being a business owner, especially when you're outsourcing all of the expertise, which is what I did in that first business, every day I would wake up, and it's not like I went to an office and got to talk with someone at the water cooler. <laughs> it was just me. <laughs> That was, that was the first fear. The first fear was, oh my gosh, I'm in this and I don't want to do it. I, I decided I changed my mind. And how do you change your mind? <laughs> the second fear point came very similar. To I realized that with the medical device company, I had built the company enough where I had the intellectual property. I was on the road to getting FDA approval. I had all of these great things happening and people like my patent attorney and my business advisors were saying, you need to go out and you need to network. And I didn't want to do that, and I was afraid. Mm -hmm. And in my first business in the interior design trade, it was somewhat easy for me because I felt accomplished, and I was working with other women because most interior designers are women and, de and decorators, or they were uh, men who were either had a real creative mind like I did, or they were gay, and I felt comfortable in that environment. Now I was expected to go and network with doctors, people in the space of biotech, and I did not feel worthy, and I was afraid. And the first networking event I went to, I walked into the room, I was the only woman, and a man flashed, you know, like a, he winked at me from across the room. And I, I flushed all over, and I thought, oh my goodness, what in the world have I gotten myself into? And I, I became scared at that moment, and I became angry, and I left, and I called the person who had suggested that I go, and I said, how could you? And he said, I didn't know that would happen. And I said, is this really what happens in business? That, and I'm in an industry, I'm in the STEM industry, science and technology. It's, it's dominated by men. I'm now comfortable with that, but that was the second fear point, was walking into a room and not feeling, number one, worthy, and not feeling comfortable. I love that story. <laughs> I, I was, I'm in a very male, well, it's changed a lot, but it's a printing industry with very male-dominated industry, and there weren't a lot of hot shot salespeople that were young, 27-year-olds out there burning it down. And um, I remember one client who's like this old-time buyer, he's very old boys network, and. I love men. I have four sons now, so I'm raising four men. I love men. I, I enjoy men. I do too. Don't get me wrong. My best friends in high school were men. I was always comfortable, yeah. you know. But there is something about that old boy that it's like a ceiling you have to break through, you know. And I remember calling on this one old guy, and he was like a purchasing agent guy, and he was going to decide whether I could have a chance to bid on a contract or not. And he was like, "So, do you golf?" And I didn't golf. Do you play tennis? Do you play tennis? And he's like, "Well, what are we going to do together?" And I said, "Business." <laughs>
for the most part. Do you have investors in your business? Um, I don't. I, I am the I am the big like you. I've I've kept it on my own. I've had offers, um, and I've had to make decisions over time. And you know, I think there are points where I've been at a crossroads where should I let someone else come in and then I have to like have a partner and how will that feel? And there were parts of it that seemed like, oh, maybe I have to take this hat and that hat off and hand it to someone else and work on the hats that I really wear especially well. Um, so that was attractive, but then what, then I'm not in control of my own destiny anymore. So being an entrepreneur, part of it is that like you wanted your own, you wanted your own. You wanted to be able to make it the way that you want to make it. You're building it to suit yourself, to suit your style, your personality, your goals, your vision. And with that, with that certainty, you know, you've heard you've heard about the hierarchy of personal needs, right? Certainty and then uncertainty, and then with that certainty that you give yourself, you open yourself up to so much other uncertainty. Mm -hmm. I think that that doesn't exist if you're working for someone in a closed environment with a lot of parameters, things you can bounce up against, then you know where the boundaries are. Yeah, you create your own. Absolutely, and because mm -hmm. that is a good point. Because when I first envisioned starting this, so um, my oldest son is 16 now his license, um, he's doing great, and I have a 13 year old, a 10 year old, and a six year old. So once I started, I just kept going. <laughs> Come here, boy, I'm up. So you know, I'm done. But, um, uh, so I, I'm very busy, I have you know, this great family, and I, they're, my, they're my world. I mean, they're the reason, they're the one beneath my, they're why. They're why I want to be successful. They're, I have to pay for their college educations. I'm saving for their braces. I've had two embraces so far, and the other two are going. Um, so you know, I, 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 they motivate me because they have needs and that sort of thing. And um, when I first started, I was thinking, well, maybe I'll sort of do it like a consulting business, and it'll be just me. When I told these many clients that I had been servicing, I decided to change things up. I'm leaving the firm. I'm gonna kind of take it home for a while and figure out what I'm gonna do and how big it should be. I immediately realized I couldn't work in my house. I had at that point, my little guy was toddling, and uh, he was like probably 10, 11 months old, and he didn't understand why mommy's here and he couldn't have her. And I felt like a gumby doll. Like the clients are calling and the baby's calling, and I felt like I was pulled in all directions, and I felt like I did a terrible job for everyone. So for me, it was better to get an office. But now I have an office, so now I have overhead. So now I have to make a certain amount of money every single week or month to pay for the office. And the clients that I, uh, announced I'm going out on my own, uh, were very supportive, so supportive in fact, that I had so much work, I didn't know how I was gonna get it all done. So then I hired two people. So now I have two people that I'm responsible for on the payroll. So now I have to make payroll and pay for an office. So before long, it, it, it does end up becoming, <coughs> it's not the freedom that you imagined it might be once you have those responsibilities, you know? Like it's great to own your own home, wonderful. But then when the water tank goes, you're the one who has to replace it, right? So it's, it's great to have a business, and it's great to have your own office, and it's great to have employees, but they rely on you now to make their mortgage payment. And, you know, you're paying your health insurance and so forth. So the pressure is, you know, always there. And the fear of letting those people down, too, that support you in your business is, is very real. And when you have investors, I have some, a small, obviously, there are 5% that own the company, and they're not me, and they're not my husband. There is a fiduciary responsibility there. Just as though, you know, Lisa has employees, I have the responsibility of thinking about my shareholders. I also have the responsibility of thinking about the Commonwealth of Massachusetts because we're partly funded. That's a lot of responsibility. Um, it does weigh on me from what I've been told, and I'm not, um, not having had a, my first business did not have investors, but um, men and women have a different, uh, <coughs> feeling of responsibility to investor money. Um, I'm very closely tied to that, and I feel immense responsibility and pressure to that every day, as though I, I, these people have cared their money with me. Um, not, it's not that every gentleman thinks that way. Some do and some don't. But most investors go into an opportunity of investing in a startup with, with knowledge of risk. And so, therefore, they, they know what they're getting into. Uh, so, that's, does that answer your question a little bit? Yeah, that's another important point, too. If, if you do have partners, be aware first of your comfort with risk. Mm -hmm. What are your parameters that you're not going to step over? But if you have investors, you've got um, stakeholders, you also want to know their comfort level with risk. 
as well and know how everyone can feel secure at the same time. That was one of the things that we've been working in, in the group. Um, the, other, the other part about investors is know your numbers. Mm -hmm. That's so important because particularly as women, we're engaged in, in the passion of what we do. We tend to choose careers that we're passionate about or that grab us in some way. And we also have to remember to um, cover that other side and be really, really intimately connected with and aware of the ongoing importance of your numbers, what they indicate about your business, are they indicating there's change on the horizon, for example, and if you're asking for investors, they're going to ask you about some of those things. What do you expect that trajectory to look like over time? Do you have an exit plan? You know, those sorts of things. You know, really, really know your numbers, you know what they can indicate for you. The numbers can be really powerful to tell you are you at the next stage for growth, you know, or turn something around. And who you surround yourself with, too. Do you have a question? Yeah, um, going back to um, risk a little bit more, there's, I think, a common um, perception that in order to be an entrepreneur, you have to thrive on risk. And um, I'm just wondering if each of you would talk a little bit about, are you, you know, avid risk takers? Um, or do you believe in that? Um, do you need to be an avid risk taker and be an entrepreneur? I am a risk taker. Um, I wouldn't have considered myself so enjoyable as my husband is not at all. He's really on the other <laughs> world of that. But um, you know if you were motivated more by what you want to move toward or what you want to move away from. Those who are okay with risk tend to be more motivated by them, what they're moving toward, which is fine because you're pulled towards something and you're going to take action in that direction. If you're motivated um, by not having something happening, so your reward or your, your punishment based. If, if you're motivated by something not happening, you're going to be more careful and you're going to be uh, maybe more meticulous and analytical and just uh, put my protections around you. Mm -hmm. And I think you can be successful either way. I think just knowing, style. yeah, knowing your style is really, really important. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> When I play Monopoly, I'm all in. <laughs> all in. I buy every piece of property I can buy, and so the money up. is gone. <laughs> That's how I play, and I don't want to play if I can't play that way. Okay. But it would have benefited me over my career to be having a little bit more of that conservative gene. Uh -huh. um, and uh, your point is great, because the investor I do have in my life is my husband. I am married, and everything I invest in my business, there have been times where I wasn't able to take much of a paycheck, in like 2001, we went through a very difficult time. Um, the industry had changed a lot. A lot of the things that I was printing were like catalog type things that were going online. I did a lot of software replication. Suddenly there's high speed internet access. People aren't replicating software as CDs and DVDs and putting them in these elaborate packages that I used to produce. So that had gone down and then September 11th happened. And if you recall, um, right after that, you know, the planes were grounded, no one wanted to fly anywhere. It was just a very difficult time um, for the country as a whole, but in business as well. Um, I'm in direct mail and the trade show business. So people weren't flying and all of a sudden there was an anthrax attack. I think I lost a million dollars in 2001. And around that same time, the dot com kind of thing was bombing and I had a lot of high tech. I wasn't as diversified as I needed to be. So these are all lessons you learn. In 2002, I was struggling and I wasn't able to take much of a paycheck for a while and I had my husband going, so wait a minute, let me get this right. We're gonna pay daycare for three kids and you're not taking a paycheck and you're working? How is this working, you know? And I needed him to believe and invest in us a little bit longer, you know, that that you know I, I, I don't wanna give up on this and I, I knew that it couldn't weather me pulling any money out of it. I needed to make more money before I could take more money. And I didn't want to close the business, and I didn't want to go to work for someone else. It was, I felt like it was a child that was on life support, and I was not willing to pull the plug, because I believed in it, you know what I'm saying? Um, so having my husband, really, as an investor that, I had to sell him that we were going to be okay, and that we were going to make it, and that I had some new ideas and new ways to think about this. And, I worked on diversifying. I get different types of clients from different verticals, from healthcare, from you know colleges and universities. I really work very hard, you know, from banking, financial institutions. I still have some high tech. I'm good at it. I get what they do. I love technology, but it's not all I can do. 
you know, and I needed to balance that out. And I worked very hard to get more into that digital age so I could live there. I love print, it's my first love. Um, I think it's still an important tool in a marketing toolbox, but it needs to live with a multi-channel marketing approach that would include email and web pages and social media. So I've had to learn all those other things. So I did evolve, um, but you know, the growing, <coughs> that, was, that was painful. It, was, it took courage to, I don't know, I don't know this stuff. I'm gonna have to learn this stuff and I had to put those hats on. What are the other types of risks that you both have had to do with other than financial risks? I was afraid, or my risk was that I would transition from the interior design trade into medical device and use what I had built for 10 years. I had a successful business. I mean, I was afraid of starting over in a field that I had no knowledge, and I was afraid that I was giving up on my, my <coughs> next work and passion, which is really what was in my heart. And I was afraid that I would never be able to go back to it. Did you have to sell your business so you could do this other business, or could you not have someone run your existing interior design business and, and do this new venture. I'm just curious. I could have, um, but you know, I think if there was one thing that I mistakenly did with the first business is that I situated myself so that I was the focal point. I didn't do the work, but I facilitated all of the operations. And I'm a master seamstress. So it's all well and good for someone to be able to sew and execute, but to find someone who is a master seamstress to be able to design all of the patterns and be able to distribute the work um, seemed to me at that point in time a little bit overwhelming. And if I had to go back, I would have built that company a little bit differently. And I did it specifically so that I could be home with my son, so that I wouldn't feel as though I had to go to an office and have employees and have that responsibility in addition to everything else. So I really did work my first business. I was fortunate to be able to do that. Um, now, fortunate is a relative word because at the time that I was transitioning from the design business to the medical device business, I was doing both. And I was working until 3, 30, 4 o'clock in the morning and I was waking up at seven in order to get my son off to school. And I guess, um, you know, this is just the way that I did it but I wanted my son to not think that his mother was working full time, but I was. I don't know if that was a, a, the appropriate thing for me to do. Uh, so when he came home at the end of the day at 3.30, 4 o'clock, I was just full time mom and I wanted to keep that. So I actually didn't build that first business appropriately in order to sell it. Um, it still exists in a very different format and it doesn't have the strength and the breadth that it did originally. It's really hard to build a business that is anchored around a, a person that you would sell that business and get any value from it without going with it. Um, and that, that was, you know, like I had offers, but really what they wanted to do was buy me. You know, um, my book of business isn't as valuable without me in it. And I'm working on that to make sure that I have a team of people and that it isn't just my show that, you know, that, that the clients that rely on us would rely on us if I was there or if I wasn't there that it would go on without me. And so men ask me that question very often. Um, and, and I work around and I network with men. They say, what happened in the first business? Did you sell it? And thinking that that is always the end game, if there's one thing that you take away from just listening to what I have to say today, write down and document, memorialize at least once a year, I do it twice a year, what you want from your life. What do you want? What goals do you have for yourself? I do it every six months. I do it in June and I do it in December. And I start with what I want in terms of my quality of life. And then I work towards what do I want in my professional career. And maybe, I, I'll take back what I said before. I don't regret the way I built Mother's Love, the first business, because it allowed me to live the life that I wanted. And that's so great because I made uh, you know, a wonderful income, doing what I loved, and I had the same quality of life and what I wanted out of life, which was to be a mother to my son and be there when he got off the bus. It took its toll on me. I ended up in the hospital. I almost died. Was that the smart decision? Probably not. So maybe that's where my conviction comes from. And my, my 
goals as to what I want personally <coughs> now in my life, especially with this business, are different. And I look at my, my goal sheet, you know, every six months, and I say, oh, I've changed. And it's different because my son now is 17. So he has different, different goals. Things. Yeah. yeah. So that's, yeah. yeah. That's a great point. And I think having short-term goals, long-term goals, both personal and professional, <coughs> is really important. Um, there's a lot of great books out there, but one that I read that helped me get centered about <coughs> that is um, The Passion Test. And it's a, it's a book that kind of just leads you through this free thinking process of what is most important to you. And you gotta really open yourself up to let the ideas flow and you know, how do you see yourself? What is your role? And you might lead yourself to um, a totally different aspect of business than you'd expected. Uh, and for me, the Savvy Workshop came from that. Um, I had been always engaged in doing a lot of public speaking and education around my industry a lot of stuff about sales, design, marketing, branding, and I started running some workshops about that and sharing my knowledge within my office. Um, I call it education-based marketing. I had put on programs like this for clients and developed stuff for them. I had done it for a lot of nonprofit organizations, and one day a light bulb just went off and said, well, why don't I just do this for me? If I'm spending all this time going out networking to chamber events and so forth, and um, sometimes I go and I don't really meet anybody that is a, a really meaningful business colleague to me, what if I developed some programming that brought in the type of people I want to work with so that they could come to my office, meet me, meet my team, um, they don't know them already, see the work that we've done, um, and, and, and benefit, it's like a one-to-many sales call every time I have one of these um, events. And I love it, and I did this fashion test thing, and one of the things that came up is I definitely have a teacher's gene in there. I love to, I love to mentor, I always have an intern. I, I love to mentor and share and coach, and it, it gives me a, a lot of, it, it was very rewarding for me to share and see that next generation of, of professionals coming up the ranks. So um, it feels good to do that. We've done that. We've collaborated a little bit. Yes. As well as and you're the same way. You like to yeah. share your knowledge and, yeah, and, and help the next generation. Of what, what that passion is or what some of those values are. Mm -hmm. And you realize they don't all have to be accomplished by the profitability and the, you know, some of the common um, ways that you look at your business. But we, we created a women's wellness series. And mm -hmm. we invited people to come in and speak. And it was the most rewarding thing. Um, Lisa was there. Annabelle was there. I didn't know. There are some things about being an entrepreneur that well known until you get there and it grows. But it's um, completely incredible when you get to collaborate and create community around things that are important to you. It, it is really wonderful, those types of opportunities to that. When I started saying yes to those things, yeah. I met you and I, yeah. you met, meet new people. So you're opening yourself up. And what I found is that when I'm working on that stuff, I know that's the I know for me that that's the, um, I know the silver bullet, if you will. When I work on that stuff, it does not feel like work at all. And I mean, I love being creative for my clients, and I get on a flow, and I that that time goes by, and I still really enjoy it. I'm so passionate about it. But when I'm working on that stuff, for me, I have more ideas than I have time. I could stay up all night writing stuff about it. I, I love to promote it. I'm, I'm excited, you know, I'm like a little kid in a candy store, like, what am I gonna do next, you know? So that passion is there, and I, 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 that book helped me like sort of tap into it. Like I knew I liked it, and when you do something and you can do it for hours and it doesn't feel like work, you can find a, a business that you can make money doing that. And you know, the first many workshops we did were not for profit. They were for promoting the Prince savvy side of the business, frankly. But they've attracted so much work. I have a bank client right now that I'm producing a series of Lunch and Learns that specifically said to me, I love what you do, I love your programming, I love how it's bringing in just the right kind of business client. We would like you to bring that to us. Will you help us? So I'm doing a whole series for them that contracted me for a year. So it did bring in like a terrific client that's doing exactly the kind of stuff I love to do. So it does, when did you get going? But again, when I first started, my husband's like, so let me get this straight. You're gonna work all day and then you're gonna work all night? <laughs> yes. <coughs> we have a question, sorry. Um, well, I, you talked about some goals and having annual goals and whatever. But what about financial goals? I mean, you know, are you, do you feel as entrepreneurs, and I'm an entrepreneur too, <coughs> that um, you're on track with where you wanna be financially today and on track for your long-term financial goals? So. No. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's really like No, no. I, I mean, I feel like, you know, uh, with the recessions and things that I've been through, 
Um, we've been up and down, and uh, you know, we get to a place where I'm like, oh, it's finally turned around, and then we'll have another low quarter. So we're still fighting the good fight in this industry and in this economy, um, and figuring out how to tweak things and change things. Um, I, I just had one full-time employee I had for 12 years leave, and I had to make a decision, like, what am I going to do about that? And I decided not to replace her. Um, and I feel like the business has changed so much that 12 years ago, I had so much work for her that she was busy, really busy, 45 hours a week. And it's changed so much that the volume of print is not there to justify that position. So I'm actually changing things up. And it's a, it, you have to constantly make the year plan, and then first quarter in, something changes in the industry or in the economy or um, with your clients. Yeah. Okay. Uh, no, I would say about a year and a half ago, we changed everything in the business model, and we were we were exceeding what our goals were at that point. Um, the quality and what I want to do to make our financial goals has really changed, and so I had to really just sweep the old away. And so we're in a rebuilding. Yeah, but it, there's a there's a quality to it that I wouldn't give up um, for this dress and the other thing that was. You also learn how little you can get by on. You know? <laughs> it's really important. We're, we're a very consumer-based culture. You know, you realize how very little you, the things that you just don't need. Um, as a business, too. You know, um, we, we were, my goodness, at the very beginning, very wasteful around our marketing. Um, and you learn those sorts of things. But you start to get a little more clear about what are the avenues that are most effective for you? And it's easier to stay on track when you get, you get clear about those sorts of things, too. Yeah. And you're in so an investment ready. mode. Well, yeah, we're going to be commercializing later this year for the medical device. Um, all of my worth, if you will, or what I own in the company is in the form of intellectual property, trade secret, um, you know, high tech manufacturing and whatnot. So. You know, I think that ultimately that will pay dividends to myself and my husband. Um, I, to answer your question, yes, I'm satisfied because I own 95% of a medical device company that's one of five emerging companies in the Commonwealth. That's, that's a lot of worth, or it's worth a lot, and it will be someday. Um, but I'm not motivated by money, and I think that, you know, that's part of my story. If I had been, I would have sold the IP portfolio three years ago and gone back to what I was doing before where I was making a really great income, doing what I loved by the priorities that I had set and changed my life. And, you know, I went through a change-altering experience that sort of focused me towards, uh, I won't feel complete until every patient has access to the device to live a better life. So that's what motivates me. I don't really think those financial metrics in terms of my own personal. How do you go from like all the crazy good ideas, you know, new new ideas, new businesses, and everything, and then you know take that next step and make sure you how do you you had so much paperwork with your FBA and everything. How do you take those steps and you know it must be just a real okay you have to do this to do this you know on the have to I have the ideas and then it's like on the have to do this.
an FDA application for approval for a device that had never been seen before. You know, people spend $350,000 for a consultant to do that and they're not guaranteed to get approval. So put yourself out there. Just, you know, if you know that someone has that expertise, go to them, be courteous and say, I want to be respectful of your time, can I buy you a cup of coffee? Will you listen to what I have to say? And at the end of that cup of coffee, if the person says, I really want to help you, they'll do it for you without charging you for that time. So that's what you really want to find. I think most entrepreneurs have some sort of dream team yes. or virtual board of directors, a good accountant, a, a good attorney, something, you know, a good intellectual property lawyer mm -hmm. um, that will help them. And if you've been through it, do you want to share? True. You know, I don't think there are any of us that wouldn't share anything. That's it's very rewarding to give back. I think particularly yeah. to women, too. I, I think we want to see each other sit. <laughs> it seems like the tide is changing and maybe things felt competitive between women before, but do you get the sense that people are more supportive of each other? Mm -hmm. Well, and particularly in New Hampshire, you know, with our government. But mm -hmm. I, I think if you ask, really, there are people in town. I was just curious how you guys managed to be unmet because that happens <laughs> and you're not sure where the next client's going to come from or uh, this vision is here but it's not quite done or I don't know how, how what are some of the tools that you've developed for yourselves to manage those times when the unknown is staring you right in the face and you've got you're not sure where the next piece will come from or come to I surround my again I surround myself with <laughs> people who have been there, done that. Because those advisors, I go to them and say, what do you think is gonna happen? And I like it when someone who is an advisor can say, I've been here before, I've seen this, and this is what happened. I don't need them to tell me what to do. I just would like someone who has seen it before to be able to give me a perspective of what they saw. And then, so that's how I see, that's how I get my crystal ball. Um, I would say, look for changes on the horizon. Annabelle says that all the time. You know, look for the changing of the tide. Um, listen to your intuition. That, that will give you a lot about what what's coming. Think, you, things really shouldn't ever be a surprise. Surprise. Um, ask for help before it's an emergency. That's one of the things I put on my list. That if you get the sense that changes are are happening, assemble your resources then and brainstorm a little bit and, and maintain an open mind and flexibility and um, and presence to still right now. You know, keep your focus on your mission and your vision. And don't let yourself get distracted by a fleeting emotion or a random thought or the headline about the economy. You know, the people that have survived the last economy were the people that stayed on track, you know, with what they were looking at and they didn't worry because that creates something physiologically that attracts more of that. Right? Right. Yeah. I use Chardonnay. <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer, what she's doing with, with her medical device, she's putting a lot of wood in the stove because she has faith that if she does that, not only is it going to keep her warm and her family warm, but it's going to probably warm the entire world of, of people who need that, that type of medical assistance. And I think that's a great thing. And when I started like the Savvy Workshop piece, I, I, like, I felt like I had to do something with it. And I was like, well, it doesn't really have to make money if I use it for a marketing tool. It doesn't, have to, it doesn't really have to make a profit. I was hoping to break even. And um, you know, over the course of the first year, I did break even, and now it's really bringing substantial business into the organization, but it was fake. And I did a lot of work and put a lot of wood in that stove before it, it gave me one ounce of warmth, really. That's so pretty excellent about what you did. Yeah. <laughs> All of you, I feel very honored to be amongst you. And uh, there's so many talented people here. Every year I come to this conference, I've been, I think, four years in a row, five years in a row. I meet terrific people every year, so it's really I'm into two of you. I'm so grateful for that. Mm -hmm. What a nice really connection. How, how are we doing on time? I think we're done. I think we're supposed to wrap up and let you